loves, God loves, all that God loves Think about, think about that Think about it Don't, don't compare your grief to anyone else's Because um, the worst grief you can go through is your own grief And two, she says, uh, you know She even said, I, I don't have this kind of relationship with my mom And the, the, the nature and character of your grief And the depth of your grief is a sacrament of the love and the the bond that you had with her um and that started to and then she gave me this homework that i had to take 30 minutes every day to grieve and i thought i can't if i start i'll never stop but but i've i realized actually if i would give space for it i would i would i would sob my guts out and then and then eventually you know your tear ducts run out of juice Historically speaking, a way station is a rest stop for weary pilgrims at the end of their day of travel. It's a safe place to get a meal, to replenish supplies, and rest up before the next day's journey. It's an opportunity to enjoy the company of others, to get news from other lands, and to exchange ideas. Way Station's podcast allows me to share with you some of the people I meet on my many travels, authors, artists, theologians, activists, people that think differently than me, who have perspectives I wouldn't come to on my own, and who enrich my vision and appreciation for the complexities that make life the wonder and challenge that it is. Thanks for joining me. My name is Steve Bell, and this is Waystation's podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode four of Waystation's podcast. I'm your host, Steve Bell. And I am quite thrilled today to have as my guest, um, uh, my friend, uh, the singer-songwriter Carolyn Ahrens. I'm going to guess most of you know who she is, but let me just read you some of her resume because she's kind of impressive. So she's written and released 14 albums. She's the author of three critically acclaimed books. 15 of her songs have become top 10 radio singles in the Canadian pop and U.S. Christian charts. She's won two Dove Awards, three Juno nominations, was recognized as the West Coast Music Awards Songwriter of the Year. She's a regular communist, communist, she's a regular (laughs) columnist (laughs) for Christianity Today. And uh, she has a degree in psychology and English from Trinity Western University, a Master of Arts in Theological Studies from Regent College, And she's currently, and she'll talk about this briefly, she's current director of education for Renovare, where she teaches or oversees the Renovare Institute for Christian Spiritual Formation. So I've known her for years. Carol and I um, and Bob Bennett toured across Canada many, many years ago. It was one of my favorite memories of my entire um, sort of adult music career was touring with those two. And uh, she's very dear to me. Um, she's been a really good friend over the years. She she lost her mom a few years ago, uh, right around the time that I lost my dad. And she she wrote a song, a beautiful song, for her mom. And I wrote a song for my dad. And I thought, well, I should just call her up. We should talk about grief and what we learned uh, from those experiences. Um, you're going to hear the song she wrote. You're going to hear the song I wrote um, as part of all that. Uh, for those of you that are listening, if you want to see the videos that go on um, with the songs, you'd have to flip over to the YouTube version of this podcast if you want to watch it. Uh, and you can do that just by, I think if you just type in Google, Google search, uh, YouTube, Steve Bell, Good Grief, you'll get it. Um, but it's fine if you just listen as well. So here's my uh, my friend, Carolyn Ahrens. Hi, Carolyn Ahrens. How are you? I am well, Steve Bell. How are you? I'm just fine. Are you in your house? Is that your bookshelf there? Yes, I'm. I'm in my house. Um, I will only be in this house another month or so. We're we're gonna move. So. Oh, okay. Where are you going? Yeah, we're just downsizing to a little uh, yep. to a condo by the beach in White Rock. Yeah. So oh, nice. It'll be nice. a big change. But you know what? I was so excited about reducing my footprint, and you know, I don't yep. need a big house. And then I walked in like the first condo and I was like, where do the books and the guitars go? This is the... <laughs> so I'm working on that, working on that. But yeah. uh, don't, don't, don't condos come with a basement like storage place or, or something like that? Yeah. Are you going to put your guitars no, in just, the garage? Just kidding. Uh, no. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Behind just the kidding. chicken wire. <laughs> Hey, Carolyn, like we all know you by your, your music and, and your songs. And of course, you've toured with me and I've toured with you and we've worked on each other's materials and stuff. But you, what, tell us about Renovari and your work with, because um, I want to talk about a song you wrote for your mom. 
yeah. a grief song, right? And and yes. we're going to talk about one I wrote for my dad. And that, but I but yes. I want to catch up people on um, your work with Renovari. So can you tell us who Renovari is and what your role there is? Yeah. Uh, so I knew you might ask me that, and I was once again asking myself the question I've been asking myself for seven years, which is, what is Renovari, and why do I love working there so much? So yeah, right. Re- Renovari is a ecumenical Christian spiritual formation organization, which sounds super dry, but isn't at all. Uh, Basically, we get to work with people who have three great longings. The the first longing is for um, more intimacy with God. They've Mm -hmm. often come from a kind of religion um, where God is kind of at arm's length. There's maybe some healing that needs to happen in their picture of God. And um, they sense that they're being invited into something more, something that mm-hmm. feels more like a friendship or maybe even union, something experiential oh, yeah. and interactive. So that's the first great longing. So what a great longing to yeah, get to work with good, people who have that longing. longing. Um, and the second longing is for transformation uh, in their world and in themselves. So again, often people come to us and they're like, man, I've been sitting in a pew for 30 years and I'm still angry or I'm still bitter or I'm still cynical or uh, whatever it is. And mm. um, there's this idea, uh, Renbury was founded by a guy named Richard Foster who wrote the book right. Celebration of Discipline. Yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a, like an almost a sh- earth shattering book for a, a lot of Protestants for sure. Yeah. 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 And the, and the big idea was, you know, only only God can heal us and make us whole, but we can cooperate. <laughs> there, yeah. are, there are things that we can do to open ourselves up to what God wants to do inside of us. And there's like, and so a big catchphrase at Renovari is grace is opposed to earning, but not effort. Like there's some stuff we can actually do to cooperate. Say that again. That's great. Grace is opposed, opposed to, earning, to earning, but, but not, not effort. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Because how do you how do you deal with this uh, this almost like this uh, this almost a false binary between effort and and grace and um, you know and and you can't sort of dismiss either one of them really. But that makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. It's funny when when just quick side story, and then I'll tell you what the third longing is. But okay, this second longing for transformation. The first time I ever saw the book Celebration of Discipline, I was on a concert tour, and my bass player Dave was reading this book. I'd never heard of it called Celebration of Discipline. And I thought that was the worst title I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's not entire. very attractive. Yeah. That's, that's no. not, we wouldn't call that, that's not clickbait, although it was written right. before clickbait was a word, but yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. the anti clickbait. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and what you need to know about Dave is that he was like the most disciplined musician you will ever meet so like everybody right. else this was on like a bus tour everybody right. else we were a hot mess pizza at night yeah chaos yeah, yeah. you know yeah. dave's eating vegetables his bed's always <laughs> made he's getting up early to run so i'm like yeah of course you would celebrate discipline you probably yeah. iron your underwear you know um but he kept saying no 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 you got to read this you got to read this and so when he was done i, I can actually still remember and i was this probably I don't, I don't even know what year this would have been, but a long time ago, it's in my mid twenties, probably. Yeah, I remember cracking over the book, reading the first couple lines of the intro, which is talking about this dilemma that you were just talking about. That people usually make it like it's all it's works, it's all our you know all our effort. We try to change ourselves. That's no good. Or grace, it's all what God does, which of course it is all what God does. Uh, but he said we don't we don't have to be hung on the horns of this dilemma. The disciplines are a way we can place ourselves before God so he can transform us. Right. And I immediately got this image of this like waterfall with this g- gorgeous pool at the bottom of the waterfall. And I kind of just instinctually knew that waterfall, that pool was like everything I was longing for, like peace and mm. God's presence and blessing everything. And then I could see myself just kind of running around the perimeter of this waterfall sweaty, parched, irritated, annoyed. There's no fence around the waterfall, but I'm just running around it. I'm not going in. Right. And and, uh, I started to see spiritual practices as a way to just go into the waterfall, just dive in, hold myself still along, still long enough. Would it also be part of, would it be sort of clearing away obstacles? Like Absolutely. 
Yeah, because I mean, I think I think yeah. for me, and I know there's a third thing, but I know for me, in terms of my own uh, spiritual life, it's not so. Uh, at my best, I sort of realize that it's not so much that God isn't willing to. Um, overflow me overwhelm me but it just I've, I've just got all kinds of obstacles i've got attachments i've got commitments yes. um that that are some of them are good and some of them need to be questioned and if and, and i and sometimes just getting getting them out of the way so the river can flow is is the work of discipline possibly maybe yeah absolutely and i think that's why often when people are kind of cataloging possible practices and you know richard foster's great insight was like hey you folks have been experimenting with this for 2000 years, let's listen to what, what they've found that works. Right. right. Um, and he was saying that to a church that was kind of like an old book was 20 years old. Right. So yeah. he was saying, Hey, let's, let's yeah. go back and see what they were doing in the third century and see what they were doing in the right. sixth century and, you know, yeah. all the way through. Um, but often when they catalog those disciplines, there's disciplines of abstinence and disciplines of engagement. So there's, there's, things that help you dive in and there's things that help you maybe clear away what's right what's okay. yeah what's keeping right. you and and i think a huge a huge insight that i really appreciate I, since then kind of working with folks at renovari is ultimately they're just disciplines of friendship like whatever you would do to make you know whatever you and i could do to make our friendship healthier there'll be some sort of analog right um, to our friendship with god and if we don't sort of root it in friendship with God, it very quickly becomes technique or right. self mastery. So right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deeply yeah. relational. But anyway, that's that is the second longing that people come with. They want, they want transformation in the world. And we talk about that too. systems and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how we can uh, act for good in the world. But but there's kind of this intuition that it there also needs to be an inner transformation for that to have any traction. Right, right, right. Right. So that's the second longing. And then the third longing is just for community. It's just for right. other people who are hungry for the same thing, um, both here and now, living alive people that you can rub shoulders with and try to learn with and um, grow with. And then also just that community of, of saints, you know, from all the centuries who have right. been after the same, after the nice. same thing. So another one of one or of our early early bylines before I ever got involved was bringing the church back to the church, you know, capital C church back to the church. Right. Like uh, this, again, this, you know, 2000 year or more kind of witness of people who have longed for these things, for intimacy with God and for transformation. And so how to, uh, so, and, and just quick advertisement. So if people are interested in that work. Yeah. Um, what do we actually do? <laughs> yeah. What do, yeah. What do you do? And, yeah. and, and who, who gets to be part of this? And is it a, is it a, do we hire you? Do I join a book club? Do I? Uh, right, right, you know, what, right. Yeah. yeah. So we do a bunch of different things. So my role at Renovari is director of education. So I get to kind of oversee anything that loosely falls in the education bucket. So the deepest dive and the thing that I get to spend the most of my time on is a thing called the Renovari Institute for Christian Spiritual Formation, which is a two-year program that anyone can go through. It's um, mostly online, but it has four week-long residencies together at a retreat center. We start a new cohort every year. Okay. Um, so there's stuff like that, but then there's also, you know, I would recommend you get to know us first uh, before, yeah. you, before <laughs> you try type that. It. So, yeah. yeah. So there is a book club we run every October to May. That's an online book club with... Um, a lot of people form little in-person groups where they are, but there's about yeah. 2,000 people that go through on online, and we try mm -hmm. to do two new books and two really old books, right. um, and that runs October to May. And then, you know, lots of, like, webinars. We've had you on, um, yep. you and the fad about things that yep. matter, um, podcasts, and, uh, like, uh, there's um, just lots of cool stuff at renovari.org, and renovari yep. is R-E-N-O-V-A-R-E. Right. R E N O V A R E dot org. Yeah. So people can sign up for like the weekly digest and start to get a feel for the right. kind of stuff okay. we're on about. And lots of other things I, I haven't mentioned. So I recommend people go yeah. check out the, okay. the website if it sounds interesting. Yeah. Thanks awesome. for asking about it. Well, you know, it's funny because um, I uh, often I think. 
people don't realize that musicians do other things. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and and, yeah. and, and I, you know, most of the musicians, the songwriters I know, are are deeply engaged in all sorts of areas of life, and, um, and yeah. nobody ever asks them about those things because we just want your next record. Um, but sometimes it's those those dives into other areas that really inform our music, that deepens our our songwriting, um, and all those sorts of things. So I, I was just glad to hear about that uh, from you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. For, so thanks listen, for there, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation, and I've actually been kind of avoiding it as well. Um, when mm-hmm. I first started this podcast, one of the first things I wanted to do is I need to talk to Carolyn about um, the grief that she sort of experienced uh, with the passing of her mom, because it kind of happened mm-hmm. in the same around time that my father died. And I was a little sideswiped by that grief. I was, I was expecting yeah. it. I thought I was ready for it. Um, and I just really, really wasn't. Um, it it yeah. took me out in a, in a way that I wasn't expecting, and and um, it, it was a it, well. I won't, we can talk more and more about. It. And then you wrote this gorgeous song, and so I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to talk about my experience. I wanted to talk about your experience. But at the same time, I was kind of not wanting to because it's it's like trying to write a poem about someone you deeply love, and you realize there are no words that can ever adequately. Um, yeah. Say this. So I'm not quite sure how to even start the thing, but you lost your mom, and I saw um, in the little things that you posted in blogs and Facebook things, I recognized a, um, a, a deep love that you had for your mother that reminded me of the love I have for my dad. That yeah. there was it was more than just someone you liked or appreciated, you know. But this was a person um, that that kind of lived inside you in a way, um, that yeah. was, um, so tell us a bit about your relationship with your mom and, and, and what happened there. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I like you, I've been sort of girding my loins for this. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's wonderful to talk about, but it costs something too, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, my mom was really some, uh, uh, she was just, her name was joy and, uh, uh, Every person I've ever known that know her have says like she was that is the most aptly named for, name for her. She really, right. really did bring joy, very, very alive in terms of her relationship with me. Which of course, you know, my my perspective on her is so egocentric because uh, I, I wrote another song about her after she died called uh, "When at Last You Lose the One That Loved You First. I mean, this right. this, this is the first person who loved me uh, even before I was born. And was um, uh, so completely with you and for you, especially in the case of her kids. Uh, right. Like, to, like it was like a nuclear source of energy in my life. Like how with me and for me she was. I don't even know if it was healthy, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> but right. I'm so yeah. so grateful for it. You know, yeah. uh, I was super shy kid. There is no way I would have ever ended up on a stage singing songs for people if I hadn't had this person who was so with me and so for me. Yeah. She was um kind of a closet writer. She's for sure where I get my love for language from. Um, my dad was a musician, so I get oh, I wow. get kind of the music side from him, but the writing writing that's, side from her. That's that's yeah. the opposite with my parents. Oh, that's really? fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she was just really something. And um and truly it sounds corny, but truly my my best friend as well as oh, wow. as well yeah. as my mom. So and uh, our lives were just very, very interwoven. And uh, I, th- I heard you say on another podcast, uh, you know, you learned about anticipatory grief when your dad was sick. I think we might have even talked about this, you and I, of when, yeah. you're, when you knew your dad was going to go. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I thought, okay, like she was sick o- off and on for a couple of years. She had, yep. she battled a lot of health issues a- at the end. And so I thought, oh, I've had a chance to, I, I know what's coming. I'm already actively grieving. Like I, I'm, it probably won't be that bad when it actually happens. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can anticipate all you want, but um, yeah, the loss, the loss itself, um, like you've, like you just said a minute ago about when you lost your dad, you think you're ready for it. Yeah. You think, you think, you know, and it, it, um, it, it took me out for yeah. a while. Yeah. yeah. 
There's also, I, I found with my own experience with my dad, there's also, I mean, besides the loss of my father, there's, you're looking down this, this huge sort of dark gulf of the mystery of finitude. Yeah. Um, how, can, how can a person that loved you before, you know, you knew you existed not exist? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, well, and, and where are they? And, and do they have memories? And, you know, and of course, as Christians, mm-hmm. you know, we were, you know, we have all kinds of things we can say about that. But ultimately, they're not available to us. And how is that possible? Yeah. 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 My one, uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Hall, he he had said he said to me when I lost her, OK, now this this is like uh, losing a mountain range, <clears throat> like your whole life has been oriented Every time you've looked at the horizon, there's been this mountain range and right. now it's gone. So you should expect to be profoundly disoriented. And I, and I think that's unique to losing a parent. And I, I had lost my dad eight years earlier. So now there yeah, are yeah. no mountain ranges, right? The, yeah, you, um, you are you so, are the mountain so, range. Yeah, which is terrible <laughs> For someone else. <laughs> <laughs> next generation. Yeah. That was the other thing. I'm yeah. the oldest kid in my family, and I'm yeah. like, oh, no. Oh, yeah, I'm, the, I'm the matriarch. This is not. Right. I'm a musician. I yeah. should not be the matriarch. Yeah, and I thought, I, I thought I'd be grown up by now, but I'm really not. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So all of that. And then plus what you're saying, yeah, just the mystery of how can how can somebody be so alive and present and – now they're not, and yes, our faith, our faith gives us some frameworks for that, but it's still deeply yeah. Yeah. mysterious. And yeah. um, you know, what another one of my colleagues and friends, Mimi Dixon, she gave me permission to keep talking to my mom. You know, she said like she oh, is okay. more alive now than she's right. ever been. Yeah, and you know, again, as a Protestant, you're like, oh, is that? Yeah. Is that okay? Is that okay? <laughs> well, you yes. know what? I mean, that I find it helpful. Even even my as a Protestant, but who has dug deeply into Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy yes. and worship now in an Anglican church, and there, there is sort of permission to have access to the saints. You know, um, and the idea is exactly that they're more alive now than they've ever been. Yeah, and they're and yeah. they're they're as close as can possibly be to the one who loved you before you even began to exist. So there's a, who loved you into being like in a way that even yeah. your parents didn't. Right. So there's, um, there is that. I mean, and, and yeah. So I've, 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 um, I've many times lied in bed and dad, can you hear me? And, and, you know, trying to sort of imagine, and you, you've got your imagination. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't ever have um, any sort of after death experience of my dad's presence. Like some people get that. They yeah. Say, you know, my, my parents showed up in a dream or, or whatever. Yeah. And I was kind of waiting for the big thing. It's never happened. Have you ever had any kind of yeah. a, a feeling? You of know, presence? what's interesting is I haven't with my mom and I would love one. Yeah. Like I'm to- I'm totally open yeah. to it. You always get the really good dreams. So I'm expecting yeah. you'll, you'll get I'm very you I have think. A, I have Steve Bell dream envy. Like you get like <laughs> these incredible <laughs> profound dreams and I get like I get, you know, I forgot to do my homework. Like yeah. that's like that's yeah. the kind of dream yeah, yeah. I have. Um but uh I actually had that with when I lost my dad, which is oh. uh the the first night. Uh I had a very uh I, actually, I don't even know what it was. I had a very strong sense of presence in my room about wow. 12 hours after he died. And I actually don't know if it was him or like yeah. the Lord comforting yeah. me or like, I don't, I actually don't, don't even know, but that's the closest I've had to an experience like that. But no, yeah, with my mom, I, I dream about her, of course, but I, but I, I don't, I don't. I don't feel like that. She has come to right. me in any way. Yes. Did yeah. you? Did you get any? Uh, did you get any sort of one of those surprise, like last minute experiences or words of wisdom or, you know, like anything like that? Like any last minute gift that you were un- not expecting? Um. You not really. Yeah. I think. Um. It was a. Uh, and I know. I want to hear about with your dad because I sense your dad. I had what we call a radiant death, just at least based yeah. on pictures I've yeah. seen, like the picture that's the end, at the end of your song video, he looks very radiant, which is mm-hmm. um, one of the things we sometimes pray for in the Institute is a radiant life and a radiant death. With my mom, it was, um, it took her a few weeks of a decline, yeah. uh, you know, where she lost consciousness and we were keeping vigil and, she was doing those things, uh, 
And and I think I will say this, these are hard things to talk about, but in case anybody is getting close to hospice or palliative care with someone they love, she was doing a thing, there's a thing people often do when they're dying where they start to reach up and, and point to a right. corner or they're see, seeing something. And at the time, I didn't know what that is. So I would put her arm back down. And then just just in the last couple of days we had with her, there was a book in the in hospice where I was with her called Final Gifts about mm-hmm. what people like these common things that people mm-hmm. do when they're dying. And I, I, I would tell anybody who's approaching that now with someone they love, read a book like that first because you'll be a better doula for right. dying if, if you have a little bit better understanding. Um, so I look back on it and I think, oh, actually, I think some things were going on and I I didn't I wasn't fully attuned to them. So it didn't it didn't completely follow my script, you know, right. for like, this right. is how my mother should die. And she yeah. should open her eyes and say, yes, oh, um, yeah. yeah. I was expecting and that too. Was, some some final, like he's going to sit something. up in his bed and some word yeah. of, he sees so something, there's either. a light. No, yeah. no, he, no, it was gruesome. It was the, his last hours were, were unpleasant. Yeah. 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 That's really, really tough. Um, really tough. But, but then when I think over the whole sort of last two years, there were yeah. lots of yeah. important exchanges. And yeah. um, we had, uh, and I know I'm so aware that somebody listening to this, you know, we, you and I even talked about this when we were talking about having this conversation, not everybody gets this kind of bond with a parent. Right. And so yeah. it's so complicated and there's so many different ways to lose somebody. Yeah. Um, but, but in the case with my mom, I do think we'd gotten to say everything yeah. we needed to say while she was still, while yeah. she was still lucid. And uh, yeah, but man, it's a thing dying dying is hard and yeah. and being present to the death were you present yeah. when your dad passed well i was present till i i he he passed about 5 minutes after i left the room uh there was a bunch of us mm. around uh him and um you know the it, it, it's at, at like when he started to go it seemed to kind of move very quick and then he plateaued uh, for right. several hours, um, having all that breathing difficulty, but he wasn't conscious. And then the nurse finally came in and said, you know what, I think we're going to be in this stage for a while. So if you all wanted to go home and brush your teeth and change your shirts or whatever, go do that. Yeah. And so we left, leaving my niece behind. Um, mm. And basically he died five minutes later. We went out the front door mm. uh, before we got the call that he had passed. So, uh, That's one of the things that said in this final gifts book is sometimes... Uh, the person, even though they don't seem present to you anymore, they will actually wait and 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 go when you're not there anymore. Uh, and I yeah. don't know why. Like if 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 they yeah. feel like it, yeah, yeah. So yeah, was I, that hard for you? Well, it. I I really did. Oh, I'm trying to cry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, stuff to talk yeah. About. I kind of wanted to be there. Yeah, you know, I kind of yeah. wanted to be there, but I, it's yeah. fine. Like I, I, I'm mm-hmm. not. You know, I'm not. Um, brutally disappointed. I mean, I was there to the last few minutes and yeah. and all that. So that yeah. was just fine. You know, with my dad, yeah. we didn't, um, the, uh, yeah, there was no sort of last, last conversation because he had a cancer that, that slowly took away his seeing and his hearing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so for the last few months of his life, he was kind of locked up. We don't really know what was going on in him. So that's yeah. brutal. That's sad. Yeah. But the sad thing is I don't remember when my last good conversation was with him because mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mm-hmm. know it was it. Yeah, and I would say the same yeah. for me. I yeah. would say the same for me. The probably the thing I do remember, and again, I don't know if I can talk about it. Um, but one thing I did know when my mom was dying, she was hanging on, hanging on. My mom had fought back from health. She should have died like ten times, right? And she kept over a period of years, yeah. and she just kept. She she so sometimes I've called her like the wounded but indefatigable mama bear who is gonna just keep <laughs> coming back to take care yeah. of us right to right. take care of us that's kind of how she was wired and um so there was a point where she was already her mind was beginning to slip away her body like nobody knew how her body was keeping going and again my colleague chris said you have to tell her that it's okay to go right yeah and which is something that people often say and so i'm re- i do remember that conversation right telling her uh which i 
again, nothing follows my script. I sobbed through the whole thing. Like how to be, <laughs> how to be reassuring, right? You're supposed to say, it's okay, mom. Yeah. We're okay. You yeah. know. I'm like, it's I'm not okay. It's not it's okay. <laughs> I'm falling my head off. But she was still lucid enough that she, 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 she heard that. And then that, that was basically the last conversation that we right. ever had. Like when oh, okay. I gave her permission and she probably died uh, two weeks later, but it was okay. it, it, that, right. that was, um, yeah. whew, but it was not, you know, this is, this is one of the things is that uh, we can really romanticize yep. uh, how the death is going to go. And some people, they do, they get the, the, the hymn sing and the person sits up and they're, you know, yeah. but um but most most of the time, I think for most people, like like dying is hard. It's yeah. hard work. Yep. She and I felt like she was kind of fighting it all the way yeah. to the end. And yeah. one of the things our our pastor said at the funeral was, um, Joy just was she she her spirit was there till the end, and her body just gave out. It just couldn't keep up. Right. And oh. that helped me. That helped yeah. me like. You know, yep. it helps to frame what's going on and what yeah. you're witness to. And and what I wanted to say is that I, I think I was, I think it, it is right and good to be present when you can, when someone yep. passes or right almost yep. to the end like you were. But you should know that it's also traumatizing. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's part the, uh, of what I would, didn't expect either that I would keep being picturing that room again and boy um, gosh that 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 really surprised me because my dad i mean his last eight hours were that like struggling for every breath and and it yeah. looked the nurse kept on saying he's not suffering he's not you know um yeah it, that it looked like he was suffering horribly yeah and of course yeah. they started to lose moisture and the skin is being held you know and yeah. so they're starting to actually look gruesome yeah. Um, almost grotesque in that that you know that that whole look and they, they looked like they you know, my dad looked like like he lost twenty pounds in the last hour of his life, right. and, and there was a ghastliness to it which haunts me. Um, you yeah. know, I wish I want to see his full face. You know, I want to see his yeah. I want to see his plump cheeks. I don't want to, I don't want the last one to be that. Um, I did have uh, my my surprise moment didn't come from my dad. It came from my mom. So my mom and my dad were both in care homes in the same home, but they were living in separate mm, rooms at that different. point. And my mom has got dementia. And um, and so when dad was like in his last little bit, I went into my mom's room and I said, mom, dad's dying. Um, uh, do you want to go say goodbye? And she goes, yes, yes. And so I wheelchair <laughs> into the room and there's dad and his breathing and deeping. And, 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 and she took his hand. You know, and she said, she said, you were so good to me. You were so good to me. Um, the way you used to, you know, bring me a candy every Saturday afternoon. And I'm kind of going, what? what? And, then, and then you took me to, to prayer meetings on Wednesday nights. And I'm going, what? And I realized she was saying goodbye to her dad. Mm. And mm. I got to witness my mom say bye to her father. And mm. she was doing. She was doing all the right. She was telling him it's okay to go. We're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. She's patting his head and stuff. So at one point, mm. I was devastated that she didn't know that was her husband. And right, the other, but but right. the gift was I got to be there to, for her to say bye to my grandfather, who I never met. Yeah. Right. So that was just. And a, there's something about like kind of the stream of love in the end, right? Like that. It, yeah. It just keeps flowing. Yeah. That's it felt so interesting. It was. It was a bit sad, but not too sad. Like like there was a yeah. there was a gift in there that that I was really grateful for. It really surprised uh, me. You know, I was not expecting uh, that one. Huh. Yeah. Wow. So the other thing that I like, I'm wondering if you felt this that um, in terms of grieving, like there's there's I mean there's yeah. a couple of different kinds of grieving. Like sometimes you grieve because something good happened. Like the mm -hmm. grief, and sometimes you grieve because something bad happened, and, and or the, the the goodness didn't happen. So I think a lot of times grief with, you know, if your parent has it hasn't been a deep bond, or there's been woundedness yeah. and stuff. So there's a grief about the loss of what should have been. Um, yeah. You and I both had the loss of because of the goodness of what was there. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, what I found shocking was how physical it was. Like, mm. like mm -hmm. um, if I was going to try to describe it, it's sort of like some. Some strange creature came and, and took a bite out of every molecule of my body, like I just mm. I felt, I felt it th from head to toe as a physical <laughs> um, wound or something. I you know, but just just mm. millions of tiny bites. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, uh, but for the longest for, time for was, me the, the I, exact exact same surprise. 
like what hard physical work it is. And for me, it felt like a crumbling, like mm. inside everything was just crumbling. Or I, I wrote a piece about it where I said, I tried to externalize that and say like, I f- like as far as functioning in everyday life, mm-hmm. in that probably for the first year, right? Um, it felt like I was walking on the soft edge of a cliff and the ground kept get, giving way and I had to keep like trying to get yeah. back onto solid ground so that I could like attend the meeting or have yeah. the conversation or whatever. And, yeah. but inside I'm crumbling and the ground I'm on is, is crumbling. So mm. yeah, it, um, in, incredibly like exhausting. It's why yeah. they say it's exhausting and. Oh yeah. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that struck me, I'm just wondering if you felt this too, is the uniqueness of it. So like, so when I lost my dad, I mean, the only way I can say it is that I'm not the first son to lose his father, right? Right. So I'm, there's nothing unique about that, right? No. Nope. I'm the first son to lose this father, right? Right. You know, and, and that yes. was, and that was a different, like that really. And so I remember when I was talking to people, and um, afterward, and at first you really want to talk about it, you want to, you know, talk about this, and then after a while you start to realize that when you talk about your dad or your mom or the beloved one, it's like coming home from a holiday and you're showing everybody your pictures. Mm. And you can tell they're not seeing what you're seeing, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. the picture doesn't, there's no aroma, there's no side view, yeah. you know, you, you, there's no temperature. Like all those things are missing from a photograph. And so yeah. you're saying, look it, I was just at this place. Isn't it wonderful? And everybody's coming, yeah, I hope this isn't going to be too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. and I, and so no, I talk, about, right. my, I talk about my dad and I can see in people's eyes that they're not getting it. But they don't and understand. I'm thinking, yeah. And then I'm thinking, well, this is... This is not right. I'm I'm not the first to lose a father, but then I start to know you're the first and only boy to lose this father. Yeah, um, yeah. and that also. That's right. And then I got quiet after that. I stopped wanting to talk. I st- mm. I, when I realized yeah. that, I didn't want people to ask me about it anymore. Yeah, and the truth is, if you'd had five brothers, I know you have sisters, but if you yeah. had five brothers, eat eat. Yeah, their their loss would have been profoundly unique. Yeah, because yeah. they're the only one who had the that relationship, that connection, yeah. all that. Yeah, you know, just un- uncata- uncatalogable yeah. lifetime of memories, exchanges, and, and memories, yeah. and yeah, the um, my my struggle was uh, I kept I kept telling myself I ha- I think I had this narrative of you don't have a right to feel this bad. Everybody loses their parents eventually. Right. Yeah, and um, and your mom you know, I, you know, people who've lost their children for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> so horribly out of season. And right. your mom, yes, you would have given anything for more time with her, but it wasn't horribly out of season. It's sad, right. but it's not a tragedy. This is the yeah. kind of talk that I, I was giving see. myself yep. and for months. And, um, and I was not doing well. That, that story was not serving me well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, um, and one one friend, I came to one of these Renovari Institute residencies, and I was just white knuckling my way through. My friend Trevor, he said he just he didn't even ask me how I was doing. He just said, "You know, the only way through it is through it, right?" Yeah, that's all. That's all he said. And then um, a few weeks after that, so this is maybe five months into it, I'm sitting on a. Uh, I work virtually with our team at Renovari, so I'm sitting on a virtual staff meeting. We're talking about a completely neutral subject, and I realized that there are just tears streaming down my face, mm-hmm. like unprovoked, yeah. Yeah. unrelated. <laughs> and I'm like, I, re- I don't think I'm doing very well. <laughs> and so I finally went to a grief counselor, just started bawling my head off in her office and just saying, you know, this is why, how, why does this feel this bad? And, uh, she said a couple things. What one? Uh, the first thing is the thing that you just said, which she said the worst grief you can go through is your own, and uh, like stop having a sliding scale. Stop, you know, this right. person's loss is more tragic, and and what you said is is even a even more nuanced version of that is that yes, of course, people, you know, lots of girls have lost their mom, lots of boys have lost their dad, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, but nobody you're the first one and and only one to lose your mom and what you had with your mom. Right. And so stop comparing yep. and just be faithful to what grief is demanding of you. Right. And, um, and, and that's something I, I would say that I have had been able to say to many po- to people many times since who are going through a loss, it actually, it, 
you're not doing it wrong that it feels this bad. It actually does feel this bad. <laughs> right. You know, because you sort of think yeah. like when when you're going through a, a, yeah. a real loss, uh, heck, I mean, I we lost our dog last week and it wasn't <laughs> like losing my mom, of course. But I once again, it's, like our family is in a huddle, we're bawling our heads off. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh, it shouldn't feel this bad. And it's like, yeah. no, it should. That's yeah. that's part of being human is for yeah. to feel this bad and to be yeah. this hard. And yeah. actually, you know, we can talk about that. There, learning to grieve well is one of the great jobs of being human. And right. there are gifts in it, but man, does it. You know what? You're, man, does your song, and I want to get to the songs, um, and, and, you know, I... I, I'm trying. I always try to keep these interviews to less than an hour, not to tax people, right. and, and we could go for two. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about the songs and just. Um, I, I wrote a song to memorialize my dad. You wrote a song to mm -hmm. memorialize your mom. I thought I wasn't going to. I just thought there's no mm -hmm. words, there's no melody, Me so I, I had decided not to. So I want to ask you about that. But in yeah. the gorgeous song that you wrote for your mom called "To Cry for You," the, your last, I guess, grief is the work that love must do. Mm -hmm. That's quite a line, you know, that it's um, it's mm -hmm. almost like a loves, you know, loves the obligation of love is to grieve. Um, yeah, I think this was so, so to we'll go back to the grief counselor's office for one minute. So she yeah. says, don't, don't compare your grief to anyone else's because um, the worst grief you can go through is your own grief. And two, she says, uh, you know, she even said, I, I don't have this kind of relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. And the 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 nature and character of your grief and the depth of your grief is a sacrament of the love and the the bond that you had with her um and that started to and then mm -hmm. she gave me this homework that i had to take 30 minutes every day to grieve and i thought i can't if i start i'll never stop right but but i i realized actually if i would give space for it i would yeah. i would i would sob my guts out and then and then eventually you yeah. know, your tear ducts run out of juice <laughs> <Yeah>. and, <laughs> and back you go. Yeah. So, yeah. so that started to make me realize that this grieving was, it was, I like how you put it, sort of the, it was a, a continued way to honor my mother and father was right. to grieve them. And, yeah. and, and, and it was a calling on me to continue to become more fully human, to right. let grief do the thing in it. Because everybody's going to grieve at some point, yeah, and I think yeah. it it is part of the way we grow our souls. Yeah, it hurts hurts like. Ugh. But oh yeah, um, yeah. Like anyway, I know, I, then, I know. What, go ahead. Oh, oh no, you go. I was I'd like the, like I I, I I somewhere I wrote about this, and I was sort of saying like um I will never be the same, and I don't want to ever be the same. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. nothing in me that at, at any point that says I can't wait till I'm through this so I can get back to normal. There will right. never be normal as I like. I never want to. I I mean to honor my father. Um, I I I never want it not to bring a tear. Right. So, at, I'm, yeah. I'm past. I'm past the point now where where grief will just kind of like take me out at the knees and take you out. You know. Yeah. Although last night, because I know we're gonna play your song in a minute, and mm -hmm. I started listening to your song just to remember all the things stuff took me out. <laughs> but at least, <laughs> well, the, and but, yours but, but that, same yeah, deal. but Thanks, but I was pal. but I, but I was yeah. at least I was lying in bed and nobody I, I wasn't yeah. you know needed to accomplish anything. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. there's something about it now where where it just felt awful back then. Now it feels holy. Now it feels sacred. Yeah, the grief yeah. feels, and it feels like a, the grief itself. And the fact that it keeps recurring uh, feels like a gift more than, yeah. you know, um, an unfortunate sort of a thing. So, so let's, I yeah. can't take too much time. So okay. tell me okay. about your song. So, tell me about your song. Uh, yeah. So you weren't going to do it. Yeah. I wasn't going to do it. How did it happen? So, should, so yes, had not thought this is not something I can give words to. Um, and actually, unlike yours, yours does a wonderful job giving us some of the texture of your dad. Mine less so. Mine is a little bit just more about about the the bond. I don't know if you can really get to know my mom through the song. But what happened was after that, uh, I saw the grief counselor a couple of times. Then I got asked to go sing at the funeral of another mom, um, oh, okay. a drummer friend of mine. His wife had died suddenly. And at the funeral, her young adult son gave the eulogy, which was very brave. And he said, hey, before I start, if you're wondering if Jordy's going to cry, of course I'm going to cry. It is my honor to cry for her. Oh. And 
And it just like these, right. I've been fighting my tears so hard, trying to be mommy's brave little girl, you know, for yep. six months. And I was like, no, this is how I honor her. This is this is how I love her now. This is what it looks like. Um, and so, so then, then, then a song, uh, ah. came, out, came out of that. Yeah. Oh, so, so thanks so, to Jordy. Yeah. All right. That's, that's wonderful. That's, yeah. it's such a beautiful song. There's, I'll just, I mean, you, I'm going to let people hear it right away. And also you did this great video. I just, well, let's talk about that for a second, but there's a lump in my okay. throat. There's a knot in my chest. I'm, I'm tired to the bone. That really, I remember the exhaustion that came with it. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of the bone, but I cannot rest, but it's the only but it's only right to feel like I do because it's my honor to cry for you. And then it goes on and sort of, you know, pulls out different nuances of that. And then you did this this gorgeous video. Uh, and I remember when you come out with a video and I was like, what, what, how is Carolyn going to do this? So you stuck, what, a GoPro on your car? Yeah, not even. Just my my phone on a That's phone your cell holder phone? on my dashboard. <laughs> I actually, I actually and, do not, do not recommend this. Um, uh, it's maybe not the safest thing to do, but I literally just went for a drive and sang along to it. With yeah, so for the movie. listeners, just because you're going you're to see it in a minute, but there's a camera on Carolyn as, as she's, you know, basically you get in the car and you just kind of drive around. And there's yeah. all it is is you drive, the picture of you and you're driving and you see the, the road in the background. And yeah. it was it was kind of, that was a brilliant move. Like just if I can just be objectively, mm. um, uh, uh, you know, ad admiring this thing that there was just there was um, there's an intensity to it of watching mm. you sing this and and you're distracted. You have to turn a corner, you know. Mm -hmm. So and that's that's again life, right? Like you have to take care of your kids. You have to take care of your 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 the people in your life. You know, there's there's still duties to do. Nobody can sort of just go away and. And purely grieve or be sad or whatever. There's still, yeah. Well, still, and I've I've had a, a lot of people say since, oh, wh where I do my grieving is in the car. Yeah, it's kind of a safe space, especially if yeah. I'm driving by myself. Yeah, and there's something. I mean, I don't know about you, but I also do songwriting in the car. There's yeah. something about that kind of the, like the distraction. Your body's doing something road, and it kind of yeah. frees up your your mind. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, so man, it is the uh, the budget for that video was zero point <laughs> zero dollars actually i think i bought a little phone mount for 10 bucks oh. um but yeah shot on an iphone not not high tech at all and it you know it's it's yeah. funny just again objectively in our careers we, yeah but you know we do these like really high production value things and right then it's like some you know yeah shaky, yeah <laughs> the thing the thing you spent no money or any real effort on that's the thing that yes. takes off yeah, yeah yeah that that thing had about a half a million shares on yeah on facebook uh, almost always somebody saying it is my honor to cry for right and then the oh. name of a person oh. they would so they would share this video and then they would honor someone and um yeah that was that was a gift because what Jordy did for me at that funeral the way he reframed yeah. this he get he he i mean i still continued to hate grieving and i and and it was still incredibly taxing and hard but it redeemed it in the sense of right this is actually um generative <laughs> like it's yeah. it actually has to do with love yeah wow. and and with honoring someone i love a lot well let's just take a minute and watch that video i want people to see it well i, th I thought we'd just sort of leave the videos to the end and show them side by side but i think we're, yeah. we're here so let's let's watch it There's a lump in my throat There's a knot in my chest I am tired to the bone But I cannot rest But it's only right To feel like I do Cause it is my honor To cry for you All the memories come back like the tide rolling in And the current is strong I go under again So I hold my breath What else can I do? Cause it is my honor To cry for you Blessed are the ones who Every tear is proof of ties that bind so strong and deep that death can 
have more than a hunch that you're somewhere so good. It'd be wrong to come back, even if you could. I will see you again, but until I do, it is my honor to cry for you. Blessed are the ones who weep, 'cause every tear. There's a lump in my throat. There's a knot in my chest. But the ache in my soul tells me I am blessed. 'Cause when the sorrow is great, the love is too. And it is my honor to cry for you. I guess grief is the word. So it is my honor to cry for you. And we're back. <laughs> okay, that's a. Uh, I don't know. That's. I can't watch that without uh, being taken to where you were. You know, just because of my mm. own experience. That's a gorgeous, gorgeous song. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Can we talk about yours? Yep. Yep. Speaking of gorgeous songs. Well, that yeah. you know, mine, mine. I was the same as you. I had, I had like. Even at my dad's funeral, you know, people were saying to me, "Boy, you're going to write a great song about your dad, aren't you?" Mm. You know, and I'm mm. like, I was almost offended by that, you know. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm not. And I really actually decided not to, um, to, to even try. But the song happened to me. It wasn't. It's. It's not like I wrote it. 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 It wrote itself in me, and it was. Um, Weren't you on so, retreat or something? Yeah, well, I actually. I, 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 it was about a month after Dad died, and I remember feeling because my dad was very well known, and so his funeral was a, a big deal. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people there, and you know, there's a it was a, and so and you you'll you'll know this, and people that have gone through this know this that you end up almost taking care of other people in their grief, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is fair enough. That's I don't don't mind mm -hmm. that, but I just sort of felt like I never really had time to just really feel it. You know, and mm -hmm. so I was going to Calgary for a medical procedure. I have some arm issues that, and so I needed a procedure, um, and um, from a specialist there. And uh, and I said to Nancy, "Do you mind if I just stay a couple extra days and just kind of sit with my dad and and have my tears?" And she's, "Of course you can." So I booked a hotel on the on the west side of Calgary, so it was overlooking the mountains, and I could see the sunset go behind. I had this nice balcony, and then I was there for three days, and every day I'd just hop in the car and go and find a nice stream somewhere by the mountains and cry and just sort of sit under these ancient monuments and feel all the things that we're talking about. And it was lovely. It was a really good thing, and I was, I'm glad I did it. The last day, I, I was out all day, and I was going to be leaving the next morning. I came back to Calgary after a day out there, and I realized that I had left that morning without eating breakfast, and I hadn't eaten lunch, and I hadn't eaten supper. Mm. And I was just starving. So I'm pulling into town Oof. at about 8, eight o'clock at night. There's this little Chinese restaurant next to my hotel. And I go in there, and there's nobody in the place, and this little prune of a lady who is, you know, is her restaurant, I guess, and she looks at me with her accent and says, where have you been? You look terrible. <laughs> so I go, what? <laughs> yeah. And she could tell right away, obviously, it was, it was grief terrible. I mean, it must have been because mm. she grabs my hand, and she's very roughly rubbing my hand. She takes me to a table, wouldn't bring mm. me a 
menu. She knew what I needed. She brought me this, and then she brought me that. You have this, and you have some of this. And she kind of mothered me uh, in this beautiful way. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, and then so that was a gorgeous surprise. It was lovely. Um, mm -hmm. It was tender, and it was. And every time she'd bring me some a new plate, she'd always rub my hand like this, very roughly, you know. And but it was a, you know, kind of a. Uh, it was gorgeous. And then I went back to the hotel, and I'm I'm sitting on the balcony, and I've got you know a little bottle of wine, and I'm looking out, and tomorrow I have to go home, and this is kind of the goodbye to the formal grief time. That's how I thought about it, and I started <laughs> thinking about all the beautiful things that happened around my dad's um, deathbed, like and, and mm -hmm. reequating myself with nieces and nephews, and. Um, some of dad's friends, mom's friends, uh, met people that I'd heard him talk about that I'd, you know, really wonderful mm -hmm. people, like, you know, his buddies. So I had all these wonderful experiences around the, the bed of my father's death. Um, and this line came to me out of the blue. It says, a fresh, tender, fresh tenderness is burgeoned with burgeoned. the dying of my, of my dad. Yeah. And, I, and I love him all the more for it. Like the mm -hmm. gift in his dying, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I thought, and I've got my hand, I've had this procedure. So my hand is all swollen like this. It's all bandaged up. I can't play. And so I just kind of tapped it onto my phone so I wouldn't remember, I wouldn't forget that line. And I thought yeah. that might be a something. And yeah. a half an hour later, the next line just popped mm -hmm. in. So I tapped the phone out and I, mm -hmm. and so about every 20 minutes, half an hour, the, the next line came. And at no point did I say, okay, I'm obviously writing a song. Right. Like, I it don't want to write a sneak song. Up on you. Yeah, it it's just kept on. Ambush. So then yeah. about one o'clock in the morning, I realized I have a completed song. I can hear the melody, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm shocked by it. Yeah. And so, I, so I go to copy it and save it to my notes, and I press cut. Uh-oh. And erase it's the gone. whole lyric. It's gone. No, gone, no. gone, gone. And I'm, I'm exactly that. Like, I was like, no. no. And of course, I've got no brain for memory. I can't remember songs I've been singing for 30 years, never mind one I wrote 20 minutes ago. So I'm, now I'm weeping because I've lost this precious gift of a song because mm -hmm. I'm an idiot. And, and I've got a bottle of wine in me too, right? So it's like, uh. mm -hmm. and so And so at that point, I, just, I realized if I didn't stay up and fight for it, I'd never get it back. Mm -hmm. And so I actually mm -hmm. had to write down individual words that I knew were at the end of sentences and think like, what would I, what, what would I have said to come up to that word? And I go, mm. Oh, it's just that line. Right. Okay. I got that mm. one. So then that would have, what would I have rhymed that with? Oh yeah. That, so what would I have said? I had to sleuth my way. I had to chase words. Like a forensic like, yeah. construction. Wow. Yeah. And then the song I, about five o'clock in the morning, I had the whole thing back. Um, wow. And so th the gift for me <laughs> In that was that it, the song came un like it was it came as gift. I didn't I didn't fight for the song. It it yeah. it just wanted to be born, but I got the the privilege mm -hmm. of fighting for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so it yeah. So it kind of I got both. It it's both gift and something that I get to, you know, I get to in a sense look at my dad and say, you know, I did this for I, you. you know, I fought this for you. Yeah. 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 So that well, that felt us, really nice. I'm, I'm so glad you fought for it because it's. <laughs> It's really, it's really something that the verses that get me are uh, the one about he, he, he had no place for shame. It makes me think yeah. of, a, of a story you tell about him. I don't, I mean, there's probably not time to tell it now, but about him tracking you down and blessing you when you were right. ashamed. Yeah. Um, and then he'd absorb another failure, another's failures and return them as a gift. We loved him all the more for it. That makes me feel like I get to know your dad. Yeah. He was that yeah. guy. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to, like he, he always would distinguish between guilt and shame. Mm. You know, and he'd say guilt is like um, putting your hand on a on a stove and you feel this pain. That's the guilt, mm -hmm. and it's a God given gift. So you'll take your Stop hand putting off. Putting your the hand stove. off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. He said so. Guilt is feeling bad for feeling bad or pain for what you've done. He said shame is feeling bad or pain for who you are. Who you he said are. one yeah. one is a gift of God and one is from the pit of hell. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he, he just believed shame was in itself evil. Um, mm. You know, he said, you know, but that doesn't mean, but don't, don't, they're two different things. Guilt yeah, and shame yeah. are two different things. My dad was full of that kind of wisdom. His, yeah. my, uh, and and uh, he could stuff. articulate it. My friends used to call him Yoda. He was that kind of, <laughs> you know, guy that, that just hang around him and something's really, really, really wonderful is going to come out eventually. So yeah. I miss him like yeah. crazy. Anyway. Yeah. 
Well, well, let's. We should probably. Um, uh, yeah, it's probably time to let this thing go. But um, uh, I'll. We'll close with this song. Um, I'll put up um, links in the show notes about Renovare, about Carolyn Renz, and your website, and um, the 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 album that this song "Cry for You" is um, called from. Um, it's on uh, recognition. That, recognition, that your latest, yeah. And there's yeah. one of my favorite songs of yours of all time is on there. That's the the flame. Um, all flame. Yeah. All flame. Oh my goodness! You know, so people like go. Oh, I'm I'm assuming it's up everywhere that you can find your stuff. Yes. Yeah. 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 Great. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, friend. Hope hopefully we can tour again together soon. I know. Let's do it. You and me yes. and Bob Bennett have to go back out again. Yes, that was <laughs> some of the most fun I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, me too. Best. Okay, love right. you. Love you too, pal. Fashioned by his father's dappled life The way he loved his children And the way he loved his wife Dad was hardly perfect And they hardly give a rip He loved him all the more for it Not scandalized by brokenness Not scandalized by pain And hellishness of shame He'd absorb another's failures And return them as a gift We loved him all the more for it My father was a trumpeter Those days have long since passed He passed along his passion to me Eager as I was We'd sit for hours and listen to the Tijuana Brass Loved him all the more for it I tenderly remember when a beauty left me in rent I was too young to consider then that love is never spent He told me pain would linger and would likely leave a dent As a believer, he believed that God is good. He was certain Jesus lived to show how everybody could, and that all our earthly sorrows couldn't be the final writ. We loved him all the more for it. My father was a fortress for my two sisters and I, but more so for our mom. Who suffered so much of her life He taught us how to live And then he taught us how to die We loved him all the more for it Dying of my dad I loved him all the more for you